Hi there, I'm Kathleen Jasper, and we're going over the SSA 6991, that's the School Superintendent Assessment. And we just did a video, part one, which is the blueprint, the structure, good words, and how to score the exam. And this video is part two, where we're actually gonna go through some practice test questions so you can see how to apply some of those strategies I talked about in part one with part two. So. Let's get started. All right, so I'm just gonna go over the blueprint really quickly, just so we can kind of recap. We do have seven content categories. We're gonna go through one through six today when we talk about our questions. We will talk about the writing in another video, okay? So let's talk about the strategic leadership, instructional leadership, climate and cultural leadership, ethical policy leadership, organizational leadership, and community leadership. You can see over here, these are the percentages that you will see them on the exam, and these are the numbers. So there are 26 questions on content category one, 19 on content category two, and on and on it goes down. I would definitely take a look at this. You certainly want to make sure that you are answering all the questions you possibly can. But let's say you took this exam and you didn't do as well as you wanted to, like you didn't pass. You can break down your score report and kind of hone in on the questions that you need to really look at, okay? Now, today we're just gonna look at some different questions. I will kind of lead you to which content category they go in. But remember, sometimes the content categories intermingle, like you're gonna see community leadership kind of threaded throughout most of the questions because you are now a, a community leader when it comes to being a superintendent. So um, just understand that they, there are specific questions for each content category, but you might see questions that have both, all right? So let's get started with number one. Now remember, I talked about good words that you wanna be looking for in the answer choices. And another thing I want you to focus on when we talk about questions is working backwards, okay? Especially on assessments like this. These assessments have big answer choices here and long narratives here. Sometimes there's a chart or a graph. And if you start up here, you are going to get lost in the narrative. My recommendation is to start in the answer choices first. That's where you want to be first and then go up into the question, all right? So you may be able to eliminate answer choices that have bad words in them, and we'll talk about those in a minute. And you may be able to zoom in on those that have good words on them, and we'll talk about that in a second. All right, let's take a look at A. Determining the level of funding that will be needed to address maintenance costs. Now, funding is something you're going to need to know, but it's not always on this test the first thing you want to be thinking about. Of course, it probably is going to be one of the first things in real life you're thinking about. But remember, on this exam, we're thinking about the community. We're thinking about teachers. So let's not go with A. I'm just going to cross it off unless the question is specific about budgets. B, quantifying the need for staff to supervise non-district events held at school. The word supervise, it's not a bad word in life, but it tends to be kind of a bad word on this exam. Um, it seems like this is more of a, you know, finding people to kind of manage some things and it's not the best. I don't love it. I'm gonna take it off. C, communicating the building capacity for various types of non-district activities. All right, communication, I like C. D, developing district policies to guide the use of schools as public space. All right, we have district policies that goes with procedures. Remember, procedures was on my good words list. We're talking about guide. We're not saying require. We don't have those negative words, right? So I like C and D. So I've narrowed it down. Let's read the question. In addition to reviewing state law, which of the following actions should the superintendent take? Very important. First, to ensure the successful joint use of public school facilities. So what this question is asking you is use, joint use. That means someone from outside of the school or outside of the district is coming in to use your facilities. So this could be a church, this could be an organization, this could be a team, this could be all kinds of things. Remember, public schools are public spaces and the community has the right to rent them out and use them. And you as the superintendent need to kind of figure that out and help your staff and, and um, district um, admin figure that out, right? So another thing here, guys, be sure when you see the word first, you're being careful here because look, if I started up here and read this question and I read all those answer choices, 
All of them look good when it comes to this particular situation. Are we gonna need to determine how much money it's gonna cost, A? Sure. Are we gonna have to figure out who's gonna supervise these non-district events? Yeah. Are we gonna have to communicate the building capacity, how many people are allowed to be in the building? Yes. And are we gonna need to develop district policies? Yes. So really all four of those things are what a superintendent would do. And you're going to see this a lot on the exam, but I need you to look at what you're going to do first. You're not going to look at funding first. You're not going to figure out, you know, supervision first. Building capacity. I mean, a lot of admin, like my old principal would totally zero in on C first. He'd be like, how many people are coming? How many people can the building hold? That would be his first thing because that's how he thought. But really what we want to do is right here. We want to develop district policies. We want to be proactive, right? Not reactive. A, B, and C feel a little bit reactive. D is the most proactive in that we develop district policies to guide the use of schools as public space before we get into any of this other stuff. And of course, as we do that, we want to bring in committees. We want to have parents, teachers, admin, custodians need to be on that committee because guess what? Custodial staff is the one that's picking up after all these people. They are a valuable voice on that committee. Always have your custodial staff on any committee. You want them to be part of the conversation all the time, all the time. They are so important. So just a little side note on that. Um, but D is going to be the best answer there. Now notice ABC are good too, but first is the key word and then being proactive, not reactive. Okay. So think of those good words when we're talking about, and those good actions and those good phrases, when we're talking about these questions. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at number two. Now, look, I got this whole big thing here, right? I'm going to get lost in that. Let's go to the answer choices first and see if I can eliminate. I may be able to, I may not be able to. Um, I also like to read the question stem too. Which of the following is the primary purpose? Another keyword, primary, the number one reason of the recommendations above, okay? We have increasing the likelihood of a su successful turnaround. So we might be turning around to school, failing school. We might be turning that around. That's going to be a big part of your job. Improving teacher administrator communication. Okay, I like the word communication. Establishing credibility in the community. All right, I like community. Alerting other schools of the need to maintain high standards. Okay, so really, I like kind of all four. So I'm not going to really be able to eliminate. I know that I'm looking for the primary purpose here, keeping that in my mind. Let's go up and take a look at the actual question here. A superintendent works with the principal and staff members of a low performing middle school, important, to implement the following research based recommendations. All right. Now we want to figure out what the primary purpose of these are. One, support change with strong leadership. Keyword change. We have a low performing middle school. We might be coming in to be change agents. That means you're essentially kicking the door off the hinges and making a lot of changes. And that's what you got to do sometimes. Number two, maintaining a consistent focus on improving instruction. So we want to go from a low performing to improvement, hopefully a high performing or at least a, a better performing school. We want to zero in on that focus. Three, make visible improvements early in the process. Why is this important? As superintendents, you need to turn things around quickly. If you've got a failing school, you got to get in there and fix it. And so make visible, meaning the teacher see it, the admin sees it, the community sees it, parents, the newspaper, reporters see it. You want people to see that there is improvements happening and especially the teachers because for the teachers to buy into all these changes, we said here, support change, right? There's going to be some changes. For the teachers to buy into the change, they need to kind of see the data that it's working. So we want to hurry up and, and get those changes moving. And we want to make visible improvements early on and build a committed staff. Now, this is also hard in a low performing school, one that may have had bad leadership in the past or problems in the past. Building that committed staff, that is tough. So you're going to have to work with the principal, maybe bring in a new principal, train your administrators. Their job is, is going to be, you know, to, to turn this thing around. Now, I just said turn around here. The answer is A, okay, because we're looking for the primary purpose. But let's see why the other ones are wrong. So we have increasing the likelihood of a, of a successful turnaround. We have change. 
We have making improvements early on, building a consistent, um, uh, committed staff. We have this low performing that we want to turn into a high performing or, a, or at least a higher performing school. A is the best thing here. Why not B? Well, improving teacher administrator communication, that's not what's going on here. That might be number four, but that's not the primary purpose. Is it good to have teacher administrator communication? Yes. Is this something you would want in the school? Yes. But it is, the, is it the primary purpose of these four objectives here? Not really. So that's out. C, establishing credibility in the community. Good. It's part of my good words list. But remember, what am I doing here? I am not talking necessarily about the community or credibility. I'm talking about fixing the low performance. I want the low performing to go to mid or high performing. All right. So C is out. It's not better than A. A is the best. D, alerting other schools of the need to maintain high standards. We're not talking about other schools here. We're talking about this school. So D is out. Even though it's got high standards, which I love, that's a good word. High standards, standards alignment, things like that is a good word. In this case, it doesn't fit. A is going to be the best answer there. Now remember, if I started up here and I read all the way down, I'm going to get lost in that language. And then when I go to, you know, A, B, C, and D, all those are going to look good to me. All right. So a couple things. We want to zero in on this primary purpose. What is the main reason for this? And then you'll be able to eliminate based on that. Okay. Let's take a look at number five. Now, these all come from the ETS study companion. Just so you know, I did not write these. These are coming straight from the ETS study companion. All right, so let's take a look at number five. Um, we've got a big narrative here, so I'm going to not do that. I'm going to go to the answer choices first and see if I can eliminate. A, having administrators ask parents for feedback when they call home to discuss discipline. Mm, I don't know about that. That seems like it's uh, not a good idea. <laughs> First of all, we have the word discipline, which is a negative word, and we want to stay away from negative words, although you are going to have to deal with discipline as a superintendent and all of that. Um, you're really going to be di dealing with disciplining teachers more so than students. Um, but having administrators ask parents for feedback right after they discipline their kid, probably not the best time for feedback because people are probably going to be angry. I'm going to take out A. B, scheduling morning community focus group meetings throughout the week. Scheduling morning community focus groups. In the morning, who's going to end up at those community focus groups? Affluent people who are able to stay home or people who are stay-at-home moms who may or may not be affluent. But most people are not going to be able to make that meeting. Why? Because they're at work. And if you're trying to get the whole community, morning community focus meetings are not when they should be. They should be at six, seven o'clock at night, which is kind of a bummer for you because you're going to be out late, but that's your job as a superintendent. You don't have morning community focus meetings. You might have some morning meetings with business leaders because they can step away from their jobs and meet with you and all of that. But someone who's working, you know, at Walmart during the day, another parent who's a teacher working, you know, most parents are working that nine to five or more like seven to six, which is the normal working day as far as I'm concerned, they're at work. So that's probably not going to happen. So weekends and nights are when you're going to need to engage with the community. Um, so B is definitely out. Never do the morning community focus unless it's like scheduled with business business owners. C, holding multiple meetings in varied locations during the day and in the evening. Okay, we've got multiple meetings, varied, and we have during the day and the evening. I like it because then you could have your stay-at-home moms or people who can go during the day. Like I, I'm not a stay at home mom. I work during the day all day, but I work in my house. So if I needed to, I could schedule it so that I could go out and do that. Um, and in the evening for someone who, like my husband, who's working all day outside the home. Okay. So I like C, I'm going to keep C. D, sending a mass email, letting parents know when a meeting will be held to gather input. Mass emails, never the best. C looks good because you've got a whole bunch of like all the good stuff going on. Multiple meetings, varied locations, north part of the district, south part of the district, east, west, all that, and at different times of the day. C is probably my correct answer. Let's take a look at the question STEM. Let's go right here. Remember, we work backwards. The superintendent can best facilitate an increase in parental involvement. I don't even need to read the rest. If I'm looking for parental involvement, C is the answer. Mass emails... A lot of parents aren't reading them. 
I mean, just they're busy. They're not reading your big, long email about whatever, okay? They want to see you. If you're in the community, they're going to come and see you. So C's the best answer. Let's just read the top. A superintendent solicits feedback from stakeholders in the early stages of developing the district's strategic plan and notices there's significantly less feedback from parents than from other district stakeholders. So we want that parent involvement. In order to get it, we need to do C. Hold multiple meetings in varied places at different times of the day. Good. All right, let's take a look at number six. I got uh, some long answer choices here. Let's take a look. A, asking parents to draft preliminary vision statement for the administrative leadership review. All right, just asking random parents. That seems very disorganized to me and probably not going to work out very well. So I'm going to cross off A. B, offering parent meetings where the superintendent presents the developed vision and goals. Hmm. Looks like they already developed the vision and goals and didn't include the parents. So B is out. C, assessing the district's readiness through input from employees early in the development process. Input from employees, I like it. Early in the development process, I like it. I'm going to leave it. D, involving employees and community members directly in the process so each has a voice. Well, there's a big old green light on D because why? A is just too random. We're asking parents, oh, here, give me some vision and goals. They don't know how to do that. Most people don't know how to develop vision and goals. But if we can involve the community, maybe there's a community um, outreach happening where we have like a set of processes that they can get involved in, you know, very organized so people can actually, you know, do what you're asking them to do. D is going to be the best. C is okay, but we're just looking for employees here. We need parents too if we're talking about vision and goals. And that's what it sounds like this question is about. Let's read it. Which of the following strategies best engages stakeholders in the process of creating a shared vision? There it is. It's got to be D all day. There you go. And notice I didn't have to read the question. I got the answer before I ever read the question. That's going to happen a lot on this exam. Not always, but it's going to happen a lot. All right. Number eight. Again, we've got some long answer choices here. Let's read them. A, demographic changes for the state, projections in migration patterns for the United States, and shifts in urban settings. Okay, sounds like data to me. B, national and state economic projections of employment rates, interest rates for home mortgages, and consumer spending. You may say, why, why do I need this? Why is this on here? As a superintendent, you're going to be real interested in uh, mortgage rates, millage rates, who's moving to the community. It's going to be a big part of your job because remember, you're in charge of like the whole community. So that's going to be important. C, student enrollment projections, revenue and expenditure projections, cash flow projections, and debt service projections. Okay. C seems more focused on the actual like district. A and B seem a little more national. You've got United States and national there. Okay. D, projections of labor availability, the number of teachers graduating in, in high need subject areas, and number of college graduates. Okay, C and D seem more towards the schools, and A and B seems more like a national um, snapshot. Let's take a look at the question. Which of the following sets of data will be most helpful to a superintendent preparing a comprehensive district budget? Well, we got the United States here and national here. I'm going to cross off A and B. That's not going to really help you much. You're going to want to look at it, but it's not going to be the most important. C, student enrollment projections. Why is that important? FTE, right? Or FEFP. Um, that's for, for Florida. You might call it something different, but it's full-time enrollment. You get uh, money based on kids in seats. So student enrollment projections, very important for you to figure out how many teachers, how many administrators you're going to need. Revenue and expenditure pro projections. Again, that revenue coming in per student and also how much you're going to have to pay. Cash flow projections. Do you have cash flow or not? And debt service. What, what debt do you owe? Did you buy property last year? Um, you know, there's all kinds of ways in which you acquire debt in the district. So C looks more like a budget to me. D, projections of labor, number of high school um, or teachers graduating in high need areas, number of college graduates. D would be better if you were doing a projection for hiring. Um, in high need areas. D would be more if it was focused on hiring procedures, okay? But C is the best answer for this, okay? All right, let's take a look at number nine. Let's take a look at the answer choices first. A, scheduling a meeting between the superintendent and the school board to analyze the community's reaction to their decision. Reaction sounds like reactive. 
And I don't know. I'm not in love with it. I'm going to leave it, but I'm not in love with it. B, establishing a proactive, oh, love it, proactive public relations plan that includes procedures for addressing school and community-related issues. B is looking good. I'm just going to put a little doop, 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 doop. B looks good. C, hiring an outside public relations consultant to handle school and community-related issues. No, no, no. Now, do we hire outside consultants to come in? Absolutely. But it's probably not going to be the answer on this exam because you need to take care of this in-house. These are your people. This is your community. You got to handle it. Okay, so C is out. D, allowing parents and community members to comment after decisions have been made that affect them. After. No, that sounds like a, a terrible idea. They need to be heard before you make decisions, right? Because that's data. Getting survey data from them, hearing their input, things like that, that's all going to be important before you make decisions. So D is out. I got A and B. Let's take a look at the question. B is probably my right answer. It's got all the good words in it. But let's take a look at the question stem here. Which of the following steps would, be, would best improve public relations with the community and minimize community dissension in the future? So we want to be proactive. Maybe something happened, they're not happy. Let's fi figure out a public relations campaign that we can help the school and community address. So B looks good. Let's read up here just to make sure. To deal with overcrowding, a school board decides to revise the attendance boundaries of the district's two high schools. Yeah, that's a big one. Due to limited communication, the board's decision caused an uproar in the community. I bet. I mean, bad communication on attendance boundaries. Um, perhaps they, what this says to me is overcrowding. They're probably telling seniors that they only have to come to school every other day, something like that. Parents are going to have a hard time with that. Some parents might not care, but other parents are going to be like, no, my kid needs to be in school because I can't trust her at home, right? My parents would have said that. She needs to be at school. That's where she needs to be, not out in the world by herself. So, um, that's going to be a problem. So instead of being reactive, we should have established a public re relations plan to introduce this before we just made the decision. But we need to fix it now. And so B is going to be the best answer. A is out. All right. And the last question. Now, I really like this question. This is, again, from the ETS study companion. I want to show you now. I'm certainly not going to read this entire thing to you because it's a lot. Well, we might end up reading the whole thing, but I want to show you when you get a question like this, working backwards is so important. All right. Now I've got all of this and you, it's so tempting to start here. Don't start there. I love that I have bullets here because it chunks the information for me and I love bullets. I'm just, I hate seeing a whole bunch of text on a page. It gives me, you know, anxiety. Um, so let's take a look here. I can see the word two is standing out to me. So let me just read that part. Normally I would start right at the answer choices, but this is like glaring at me. So which two of the following actions by the superintendent appropriately respond to the key summary information above? Okay. So I know I need two. That's important before I start reading the answer choices. So let's just read them and see if there's any bad ones we can get rid of and any good ones we can keep. A. Form a committee to update the lessons in the curriculum guide for alignment and address the learning needs of diverse populations. I like it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep A. I might end up keeping them all because they all look kind of good. But forming a committee, good. Diverse populations, good. Alignment, good. Curriculum, good. All right. Let's go with B. Administer a survey to teachers and administrators to gauge the quality and alignment of the curriculum. Okay. I like that too. But here's the thing. Survey, be on the lookout for things. I see this all the time on the exams. Do surveys tell you how aligned the curriculum is? No, they just tell you how aligned people think the curriculum is. You might like the curriculum and you might be like, oh yeah, it's totally aligned. But the test scores tell you something completely different. So while you should certainly keep in mind what teachers are having to say about the curriculum and its alignment, the real way to gauge alignment is through achievement scores and through, um, you know, numbers, scores. So I'm going to cross off B because that's a trap. Be on the lookout for those traps when it comes to leadership exams. They'll say, oh, a survey to see if students are, you know, performing well. Surveys don't tell you that students are performing well. Numbers do. 
Are surveys just as important as numbers? Yes, but for different things you're trying to measure. Attitudes, understanding, you know, the way people feel about things, all of that is just as important as numbers, but we don't gauge the quality of alignment that way. Alignment comes from, is it aligned? Yes, why? Because students are achieving on the test it's aligned to. C, provide exemplars as explicit guidance on student learning expectations at each grade level. All right, I like it. I have exemplars and explicit, love that word, explicit guidance being pinpointy. Um, and then we have learning expectations at each grade level. So we're doing multiple grades here. All right, I like C, I'm gonna keep it. D, track instructional materials and supplemental resources used to implement college and career readiness standards. Another trap. Just like surveys, tracking instructional materials and supplemental resources what does that mean? You're just looking at instructional materials. You're not actually looking at instruction. You're not actually looking at achievement. You're not actually looking at how students are performing. What are you looking at the textbooks? That's important. I mean, you should be flipping through the textbooks, making sure you know that they're initially aligned, but tracking them, like why would you track them? Where are you tracking them to? No, be on the lookout for things like that. They put those in answer choice. It sounds good, right? Track instructional methods and supplemental resources. But all that means is what you're looking at the textbook. That doesn't, it's not gonna tell you a lot. E, create professional development systems that support teachers in making inf effective instructional decisions. Okay, I like E also. So I need two, I have three, but I got rid of two. So that's good. Um, e, I like, we wanna make sure we have professional development for, um, teachers in order for them to realize the vision that the school and the district has. All right, so let's take a look at the question, see if we can get rid of one. After a district-wide curriculum audit, all right, we did an audit, the superintendent reviews key summary information regarding the districts, and here we have writing program. Very important, there are gonna be specifics in here. And here's what they came up with. Bullet one, curriculum guides were created two years ago and are being implemented across the district. 95% of teachers report using them. Okay, but request better examples of differentiation. So most of the teachers are using the curriculum guides that were done two years ago. Two years ago is a little bit long when you're talking about schools, but not that, it's not like it was 10 years ago. I mean, it was two years ago and 95% are using it. All right, not bad data there, good. The second bullet, student writing samples scored by teachers across the district show below grade level expectations for student mastery. All right, so across the district, we're looking at below grade level, not good. Student writing standards were updated by the legislator, le legislature last year. So we have new standards. That's important. We're gonna have to make some changes. As soon as new standards come in, things change. You guys know that. You probably get the email about it. And then we have here, 82% of high school teachers report implementing the new college and career readiness uh, standards for language arts. So we got a pretty good participation. We'd like it to be in the 90s, but they can be independent, right? So we understand 82% is pretty good. Um, and the last bullet, district development benchmarks were updated this year. So another kind of standards and benchmark were updated this year and reflect appropriate rigor and alignment. All right, we have rigor and alignment here. And then we have updated. So basically we have an audit came in. We've updated to the new standards based on the legislature. We are using curriculum guides, but they were from two years ago and we've got updated as last year and just this year. So we need to make some changes here. Now let's take a look at A one more time. Form a committee to update the lessons. Update update yes 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 curriculum guides for alignment to the new standards and we have this learning needs of diverse populations they were asking here for more examples of differentiation how do you meet the needs of diverse populations you differentiate a yes i'm choosing it for sure i got rid of b because that is a mess c provide exemplars as explicit guidance on student learning expectations at each grade level well, look at this second bullet here. Student writing samples scored by teachers, they're showing below grade level. We wanna show above grade level. We need examples. What is above grade level or what is on grade level? So we need ex examples. That's what exemplars are as explicit guidance. Yes, yes, yes. If we want the achievement to go up, we need explicit instruction and guidance. That's what teachers are hungry for. They're constantly saying to you, what do you want me to do? <laughs> 
<laughs> Tell me what you want me to do, right? So C is going to do that. Now let's get rid of E and Y. Create professional development systems that support teachers in making effective instructional decisions. It's too general. A and C are directly focused on what's going on here in what we're talking about. E is good. It's got good stuff in it, but it's not the most important. So E is out, leaving me with A and C as my answer. All right. So that's how you would attack one of those questions. Take your time, read it over. You have time on this test to kind of move things around. But notice you're going to save time. If you start at the bottom and go up, you're saving time. If you start at the top and work down, you're going to spend five, six, seven more minutes on this um, particular question. All right. All right. So I hope you enjoyed this particular session on the SSA 6991. Remember, we used samples from the ETS study companion. So this all came from ETS and you can do the same. You can pull up that blueprint, pull up that test specification, go through these test questions, go through the guiding questions at the end, which I talked about in part one video and really dig in and understand what's going on. Like I talked about in our last question on um, this particular video, you notice that there are little things in there, you know, like the survey and the instructional materials. Be on the lookout for those traps because they're all over this exam. And now that you know them, you'll be able to find them right away and be successful. Thank you so much for watching our YouTube channel today. If you have any comments, please go ahead and leave them below. And if you'd like us to film anything else, let us know in the comments below. If you're enjoying the channel, please subscribe and tell your friends we're here and hit the notifications button so you're notified when we upload new content. Thank you so much and have an awesome day.